Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's um, very good to be here. Good to be up north. I love it up here. Um, never been to Barnsley before. Um, good to be here for the first time. You're all very generous in, and very welcoming. Thank you. And thank you to John Locock for um, having me to stay last night as well. Um, never in a million years did I think that I was going to be uh, talking at a... Um, party conference. Um, I'm not really a fan of party politics, um, with the exception of you guys. <laughs> and the reason why that is, um, is because I'm liking what I'm seeing on your website. Um, we had some sort of IT issues, just that, so I'm going to see if I can move the slides on, and you may be able to see them, and if not, uh, I will try and fill in the detail if you can't see the visuals. Um, the first thing that I'm going to ask you is um, the question I asked a month ago in, in another presentation in York, um, is, is Parliament sovereign? <clears throat> and I'm going to leave it hanging just for the moment, if that's all right. Um, and then I'm going to follow it up with another question straight away. Do we live in a democracy? <coughs> and another one. Should we live in a democracy? So I'm going to come on to answer these questions, but I'm just leaving them hanging for here for the moment. So I was saying just now that um, I had a, a good look at, at your website, um, and uh, I'm seeing some very nice things. Um, I'm seeing references to the Constitution, which you don't often see. You don't often see that in party politics, where people are actually talking about the Constitution. Um, so we will fight to take care of our own people, especially those least able to help themselves and to assert the sovereign will of the British people over our servants in Parliament, our servants in Parliament, by campaigning for direct democracy through our landmark policy, the Parallel Parliament. Um, well, the Parallel Parliament is, is your bit, but I do like the, uh, the references here. I'm, I'm enjoying this. Um, so moving on, um, we've got some other bits here where you've said... Uh, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not marking your exam, it's all right. Um, <laughs> Uh, the only safeguard that exists to preserve our way of life, the Constitution, and central to all of the liberties that we enjoy, liberties that the blood of veterans was shed to preserve and which may take for we may take for granted, is the principle of democracy, of government by consent, the only legal and moral basis of Parliament's legitimacy to govern. Now, these are great sentiments. I'm really liking this. But what I'm often finding... Um, is that even those that might profess to know about the British Constitution, there are often some hidden confusions. And actually, if we dig into that, uh, where is that government con con consent coming from? Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to rattle through it, because I think we've got quite a lot of information here to, to talk about. But I'm going to start with just laying this out as... Um, as I understand it, and I was introduced as an expert. I'm not an expert. I've just, I've just read into it a lot and quite deeply. And I've also not, I think, not made the, the, um, the mistake along the way of thinking, right, I know about it now. I'm always uncovering more. Um, now, when we really get into the meat of how consent is given, we begin to realise that there are some confusions here. How is it that the people have sovereignty? I've sort of answered the question there. Does Parliament... Um, is Parliament sovereign? Well, it's the people, actually, that um, retain sovereignty at all times under the British Constitution, if it's working as it should be. And we'll go into how that is. Now, in this presentation, as I've sort of already hinted at, um, it's going to be a, a sweet pill, because I've been saying some nice things about you. Um, but at the same time, there might be the odd surprise, which might come as a bitter pill as well. Um, but that's all right. Um, we can consolidate all of this information. So what we're going to start with is the fact that innately within ourselves, there is a desire, to, we, or, or at least we feel that there should be an influence over our government. We, the people, should have influence over our government. People feel that they should have that influence. Why do they? Well, the reason for that is you need to ask yourself the question, who came first? Did the government come first or was it the people? What exists in nature? Well, the people exist in nature. 
The government is created then, afterwards, by the people. So the government is a fiction. And you cannot have the fiction gaining authority over its creator. I mean, it's an essential principle, isn't it? Glad you like that. It's good. I'll, I'll come out with a few of those. <laughs> and what we're talking about here is the system of equity. Now, any system of governments with any, co any country has a single test. And that is, is it a legitimate system of equity? And what that means, if we just drill into that a little bit, is are all the people um, under the law equally? Or do some have privilege um, and are not quite uh, subject to the law in quite the same way? Well, clearly I think we know that, that under the British Constitution it was always intended that um, everybody is equal under the law. And we're going to drill into that as well. Now, in a society, you need to ask yourself the question, well, who creates society's rules and regulations? Now, if it's the government, then they become the judge and the executioner. Because a society is governed through its laws. So the people decide on the character of the society or community in which they wish to live. It is not the people in special positions of power or privilege to decide what is just and fair. It is the people that decide that. They create society's regulation under which they agree to live. And this starts to beg the question, well, how? How does that happen? And I think that's the bit that's missing Maybe in your minds, I don't know. There is a magic mechanism, which is often lost on people who perhaps have drilled into the subject of constitutionalism um, and, uh, and, and real democracy, which I'll come on to, and what, the, what real democracy actually is. Uh, and that primary mechanism that defines democracy currently eludes us as a society. It's very well hidden, very occulted in society, very deliberately. Still very few in society who understand the key characteristic of real democracy. Even many political commentators, either through ignorance or deliberate deception, hide this real truth. So this is the system of equity that we're talking about. It is the people that make up a society themselves that envision the principles of fairness and justice within their own society. And by the way, that was Justice James Wilson, who was the co-author of the United States Constitution. He wrote that in his, his works, I think it's volume 2, chapter 6. And they fall under the same system that we do. Now, you probably can't see that, but um, I've put up the... Um, the structure of the government as most people understand it now today, and it's certainly the structure of the government that most of those in the establishment would understand it. So we have, if you can't see it, it's the head of state at the top, and then we have three branches of government underneath. We have the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. And just to recap, I mean, if you don't know this, and quite frankly, it's, I find it not that interesting, actually, because this is the the, the mechanisms of government that I'm not so interested in. Because when you see how it's supposed to function, this bit doesn't really matter so much. And you'll see why. So the legislature, of course, is all about... Well, that contains Parliament. That's the Lords and the House of Lords and the House of Commons. They're the ones that make government law. They don't make it, actually, but they propose it. Um, and then it gets created according to... Uh, well, we'll come on to that one in a minute. Um, then we have the judiciary... Um, that's the court system, judges, and then we have the executive, which is sort of everything else. It's the police, it's the prison service, it's, well, the executive is those, it, it's when you execute punishment on the accused, if, if they've been found guilty. Yeah, that's where it comes from. So they're carrying out what needs to be done. So those are the three branches of, of government. And then at the bottom on the diagram, you probably can't see, is we've got the people underneath. Because, let's face it, it's been ingrained within us that... Government is an authority, and the people are underneath. It's not how it is. 
Now, the reason why those three branches are there is that within a functioning government, um, they're supposed to be checks and balances on each other. But it doesn't deal with the issue that if the entire government machinery is corrupt. <clears throat> now, we, let's just think about um, how most people think that we have influence on the government now. We th most people think that we have influence on the government by voting in elections. That's quite important for you guys. <laughs> and that's actually what most people think democracy is. But it isn't, in fact. That's not the defining characteristic of democracy. So what is it, voting in elections? Now, first, in a moment, we'll just examine you know, how effective that is in holding the government to account. We'll just have a quick quick run through of some of the some of the problems some of the shortfalls because there are many um, in fact if we just do that quickly so problems with the system first of all we have to fight to be heard it sort of presupposes essentially that that our rights and our freedoms um, have to be negotiated in some way have to be fought for um, and the most obvious thing of course is that it turns the cut the um, the whole country into a competition Freedoms are gained only ever at the expense of those that lose. Now, further to that, modern legislation micromanages everything. It's laying down the law on too much detail, because it was never intended to be like that. The law is supposed to function on principle. So, in other words, if we had less of it, then there would be more common ground. The problem we've got now is that the manifesto of a party has to match your worldview, and then you'll vote for it. But there's no way that that's going to match everybody else's worldview. It's just, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it, you know. So law needs to do less. Now, further to that, of course, we have things like the parliamentary whip system. So even if, um, well, you know, do, do parties actually follow their manifesto for a start? Um, and secondly, when they're actually in, in power, they're well, not in power, they're in office, of course, um, how, you know, we know about the parliamentary whip system. Um, they're actually uh, pushed into, into voting certain ways and not listening to their constituents, and, you know, we know all of that. Now, aside from that, um, this is where the conspiracy element comes in. I'm, I'm generally known as, um, at my workplace, I think, as their pet conspiracy theorist. Um, <laughs> Um, and you'll begin to wonder why as we get into this presentation. And the reason why I'm introducing that um, is because really the covering up and the hiding of how the British Constitution is supposed to work is an 800-year conspiracy. That's what it is. And so a little later on in the presentation, we're going to open up some of the bigger themes here, um, which, if you're not familiar with, are a little bit frightening to, to, um, to face when you first do so. So, um, further problems. Um, I'm just going to read this out, actually. Um, when an issue is forced onto the agenda, especially one of which the establishment is not generally in favour, a multitude of delaying and prevarication techniques are used, and misdirection and downright deceit becomes the order of the day in order to confuse the public and generally obfuscate the issues. Um, further to that, of course, the existence of corporate favours, special relationships and backhanders, um, leading to politicians winning lucrative positions in uh, industry, powerful positions in government, um, through what is sometimes known as the revolving door problem. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's totally dysfunctional. Getting worked up now. You may not be able to see that. Um, now, what I've got there is is a an illustration of first of all on the right hand side the diagram um, that I showed you earlier um, of the structure of government with the people at the bottom. But on the left hand side, I've got an illustration. Um, which actually is much more accurate. Um, it's, a, it's the pecking order, as it really is. Okay, so what have we got? At the top, we've got natural law. 
and I'm going to come on to what natural law is in a moment, but not touch on it too deeply because it's a massive subject. Underneath natural law, we've got the rule of law. People throw that term around without really understanding what it actually is. Then underneath the rule of law, we've got the people. And then under that, we've got government, because government was created by the people. And then underneath government, we've got politicians um, and public servants, because they work for us. That's news to them, isn't it? <laughs> I remember I was saying that the creation of government is by the people. Um, We talked about that. So perhaps we should go through exactly what what this is now. So if you can see this, this is in a bit more detail now. So starting with the top, we've got natural law. Now what this is, is um, this is the universe. This is um, the law built into the universe. Um, It's, if you, I, I sometimes call it God's law, but I'm not a religious person, it doesn't matter whether you are or you aren't. Um, This is a very deep subject, and it's very esoteric material. Um, Now, just keeping it fairly pragmatic for the moment, natural law is, um, is that sense of right and wrong that we all have built into us, that sense of justice and fairness. Now, the interesting thing, I was talking with John about this last night, the interesting thing about that sense of justice and fairness is that we all have it regardless of what culture we exist in. We all understand it. We innately know whether something's unfair. Um, You can go to any part of the world, uh, and the other interesting thing is is that we express it as children as well, very young children. We react when something is deeply unfair. Now that sort of suggests it's kind of the exposure of natural law existing within the universe. Now, if you're really into the the raw expression of natural law and going back to the hermetic principles, I did a talk in Nottingham in March, and it's on the New Chartist Movement website if you're interested. Um, But really, natural law is a system. It's almost a a system of science, really. It's it's a system of dynamics that's built into the universe. Some people call it karma. That if you actually do something that is out of alignment with natural law, you're going to get something back. You're going to get negative consequences. Sometimes it's been called consequentialism. So some of you might know Jordan Peterson, um, interesting character. Um, he's a clinical psychologist, and there's a fabulous piece of video where he talks about how people don't ever get away with it. And he talks about how um, when he's dealing with people's issues, and, and they've really had some horrendous things happening in their life, and if you trace it back... Um, you keep going back and eventually you'll find something. And and it's just, it's it's as if, um, you know, that was the cause. And it's sent ripples into the universe and they've come back. It's very esoteric stuff, but get into that material if you're interested. But at least at the practical level, I think you'll understand, at the empirical level, if you like, that there is something there in all of us that we all understand, the sense of right and wrong. And it's what comes from the golden rule. Uh, We talk about the golden rule, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Um, all of that is really um, a sense of, of you know, uh, it, well, in fact, all of those rules in the Ten Commandments are really about taking property from other people, taking, what is, ta- taking their decision or their choices away from them in some form. So underneath the natural law, we have um, a manifestation of that natural law into what's visible in the visible realm is the, is, is the rule of law and common law. So what common law is, is our conscience, which is the conduit, taking that sense of right and wrong and turning it into man-made laws. Common law is man-made law. It's just not government-made law. It's made by the people. In what situation? Juries. Now you're probably beginning to get where I'm going with this. And the head of state, of course, is is meant to be charged with looking after that rule of law and keeping it in place and maintaining it. Then we have us underneath that, and then we have the artificial organisation that was created by us, the government, and then, of course, the officers that take oaths, the politicians and public servants. So that's just kind of going through um, a little bit and, and understanding that. Now, the next slide is, you may, again try and see it, but it's how we bring these two sides, these two diagrams together. 
So we can still have um, the, the understanding of the three branches of government and roll it into the left-hand side. But it just looks a little different because... Um, in fact, let me just go through... Uh, if you can see that, you can see that the people are on the same level as the head of state. Because remember that all are equal in the eyes of the law, including the head of state. They just got a, an office. <coughs> right, I'm going to throw some interesting questions out now. Um, why is it that English law, British law now, has had such respect the world over? Because, quite frankly, if it were not such a serious subject, that would cause many to howl with mirth with the situation it is at the moment, wouldn't it? So why is it respected the world over? How did we get here? How did we get into a position in which the people have nothing but disdain and contempt for the establishment? Because that's, the, that's, that's the situation. Democracy is our greatest export, so we're sometimes told. So what's changed? That's the key, isn't it? OK, I'll try and explain what I'm, what's going on here. Now, we have... Um, I'll play it anyway for anyone who wants to move up to the front and have a look at it. But essentially, we've got um, what looks like a bunch of garden peas. Um, this is actually uh, us, just members of the community. Dots. OK? And one of those individuals becomes the accused, because they've been accused of doing something they shouldn't have been doing. Then we have 12 further people of the community who get picked at random. So they become the jury. And then what should happen is we have another member of our community who is elected <coughs> to become what we think of now as the judge. But under common law, they're actually supposed to be called the convener. They are not the judge. It's the jury that are the judges, because otherwise it's not trial by jury. It's trial by something else, but it's certainly not trial by jury. Now, that situation creates justice in a common law situation. So this is how natural law is manifested through human conscience. That's the situation I've just described. OK, now I've got, on the next slide, I've got a, a series of 12 uh, people looking a little bit confused, sitting there um, behind a desk. They are, of course, the jury. And they've got thought bubbles coming out above them, if you imagine that. Um, and just to give you uh, an idea of, of what some of those are, so we've got um, words like fair, question mark, deliberate, question mark, guilty, intent, question mark, would I have done this, context, question mark, was this planned, question mark. All of these are questions, they're asking these obviously. Malicious, reasons, why? Yeah, because the, the, the essence of that, of course, is that um, the decision that is returned by the jury is based on principle. It's not based on the, on the outcome. Did they technically break the law? Possibly. That's nothing to do with it, though. It's a question of whether there's guilt. Okay? And guilt is all about whether there is uh, what is called in Latin mens rea. Sounds like something rather unpleasant. Um, malice of forethought. Is there malice? Is there a malicious intent? Now, there are one or two other important facts about trial by jury that you, you should know about, because the trial by jury that we have at the moment is a watered-down plastic version of trial by jury. But the original, proper trial by jury that should be lawfully in place, according to our Constitution, is a whole different beast. And it seriously has teeth. Before I get on to why, and you guessed it already, possibly, but I'm just going to show, just going to outline a few other bits and pieces. So it's about motivations, intent, and context. And by the way, the jury is supposed to um, decide on punishment. They are supposed to give the punishment, not the, not the judge. 
There should never be any interference from the judge, the convener, because they're not supposed to direct it. And the reason for that is because each juror should be judging privately according to their own conscience. Remember, they're tapping into natural law through their conscience. Is this fair? Is it just? That's what they're asking themselves. Now, in the next slide, we have all of the jurors returning their own individual verdict, their own decision, as guilty, except one of them. One of them's thinking, no, I'm not happy about this. There's something not right. It's not, it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, to me, feel fair to pass punishment on this individual. So I'm going to return not guilty, quite within their rights to do so. It's a private decision. And therefore, what happens to that verdict overall from the jury? It's not guilty. Because in order for it to be a guilty verdict, every single one of those jury members has to return guilty. It's more important under common law that a good man is not punished rather than a bad man is punished, if you see what I mean. Because that can be rectified later. You try and live in a community where um, you have done something. I mean, people know about it, don't they? And, you know, uh, what goes around comes around. But what mustn't happen under common law is for a good man to be punished. Now, the most important thing, and this is the absolute critical thing, this is, this is the central point of this presentation. What is the effect of that situation where you've got one individual who's decided not guilty, but let's say, for example, that the accused actually has technically broken the law, broken the legislation? Now, this is the key. What happens in that situation? Well, what happens is that because a not guilty verdict is returned, but he has technically broken legislation, that means that that statute starts the process of being extracted from the statute book. It's called annulment by jury. That's the whole point of trial by jury. So, going back to what you are talking about, about direct democracy, etc., etc., I love it, but actually, there's, a, there's an even more powerful mechanism already built into the, into, the, into the Constitution, and it's called annulment by jury. But they hid it. It's meant to be lawfully in place. It's the most important thing. Now, in that situation, think about it. One single individual caused that statute to be thrown off the statute books. One. Out of the whole country. Isn't that, is that power? That's power of the people. Now, the only other important thing to make there before I move on, um, on that one, is that that, that whole mechanism can be used defensively, of course. We know that when you're accused. But it's also built into the Constitution that, that trial by jury is to, be, is to be used as a weapon as well, under common law private prosecution, cost-free. That means that if you're a public servant that has been involved in passing legislation that is deemed to be unfair by the jury, you can be prosecuted by anyone else, by a, by a member of the public, free of charge. That seriously exposes public servants. Can you imagine that? You imagine telling them that now if they were in here. No, 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 Ridiculous. Yeah, that changes the, the ball game, doesn't it, completely? So let's just recap a minute. Um, I don't think that's on, is it? But I'll just keep going anyway. Um, trial by jury. The phenomenon long upheld by civilised people. Now, this is a, a quote taken from one of the most important books on this very subject by a gentleman called Ken Dudney called Democracy Defined the Manifesto. And I seriously urge you to look this guy up. Look up the um, Democracy Defined uh, website and, and please, if, if this is the most important book I've ever bought. I don't have shares, by the way. <laughs> um, because most law books, and I've seen... I've read some of the, the, the books that, that are read by students of law, and it doesn't talk about any of this. 
obviously. Well, aren't we surprised? Um, this is what Ken has to say. I mean, he has a lot to say, but this is a particularly good one. Um, the phenomenon long upheld by civilised people, the consciences of a common law jury of 12 form a safer, purer tribunal than those of specially appointed individuals holding permanent offices, lucratively remunerated and bound to enforce the government's legislation. Yeah. Now, there is actually, just to prove all of this, there is actually quite an interesting plaque in the Old Bailey, which they've gone a little bit coy about because they've moved it. I've never seen it, actually, but um, a colleague of mine at the New Chartist Movement um, was telling me that they've moved it into a rather hidden location. Not surprising. Um, and this plaque is all about um, how William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, of course, and William Mead were tried for unlawful assembly of preaching. And what this plaque is, it, it commemorates, I'll read it to you. Um, <clears throat> the, um, for William Penn and William Mead were tried in 1670 for preaching to an unlawful assembly uh, in Grace Church Street. This tablet uh, commemorates the courage and endurance of the jury, Thomas Vere, Edward Bush, uh, sorry, Thomas Vere, Edward Bushell, and ten others who refused to give a verdict against them, although locked up without food for two nights and were fined for their final verdict of not guilty. Um, and then it goes on and what happened. But, but the important point here is that they, they, they did break the law. They were quite open about it. Um, quite un unashamed, but it, it was regarded that totally unfair. It was did not just, and they returned a not guilty verdict, and uh, they got hammered for it by the establishment. Um, and that's talked about in, in Democracy Defined very clearly there, but that, that's an interesting plaque, because that really uh, speaks volumes. Now, here's a statement attributed by Bancroft, Bancroft in the History of the United States Constitution. This was a um, history of the United States Constitution to judge Theophilus Parsons at the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention. If a juror or any citizen accepts as the law that which the judge states, then that juror or citizen has accepted the exercise of absolute authority of a government, a government employee and has surrendered a power and right that was once the citizen's safeguard of liberty. So I just want to clarify about jurisdiction. So going back a little bit to the pecking order, we have God-created law, which is natural law. We have people-created law. That's the ordinary people creating law, because they're next. Creating common law. So a lot of people in the, um, in the judiciary and the legal profession will tell you, no, no, common law is, is judge-made. No, it's not. It's made by the people, because it's made by the decisions of juries. It's a consolidation of the decisions of juries. So, and then we have government-created law statutes. And government is allowed to create law, but only within the constraints and what is, uh, what is, is, is allowed by, by trial by jury, by a process. So every time it comes up, when somebody is tried, it's tested. Every time. So government can... Now, this is important. Government can repeal anything that they created or a previous government. Government cannot repeal or amend constitutional law. But, of course, they did following the 1215 Magna Carta. Now, the 1215 Magna Carta is your constitution. That's it. It's just that. The 1215 Magna Carta. We'll come on to a, li a little bit more about that in just a moment. But, of course, they tried to amend it. They created legislative rewrites of the Magna Carta later on. It was illegal to do so, because they can't rewrite constitutional law. They cannot tamper with the framework that they themselves are a part. Otherwise, they're writing themselves into judicial authority. Government has no authority to, ta I've said that, to tamper with the structure of which it itself is a part. It cannot rewrite it. It cannot write itself into constitutional authority. Now, that slightly begs the question about one or two other um, documents that sometimes we wrongly attribute as constitutional. So let's talk about the Bill of Rights, for example. 
Now, the Bill of Rights is not a constitutional document. Why? Because it's a bill. It was an act of Parliament. Yeah, I was gutted as well <laughs> when I first heard that. Particularly because, um, you know, it, it, it's expressing some pretty important and constitutional-sounding things. But that was the problem. Because, and I'll just read this. First, um, th this was a trap, actually. Um, the Magna Carta. Sorry, the, the, um, the Bill of Rights was a trap. Um, because it, 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 although it does contain one or two constitutional libertarian sentiments, such as, for example, the no foreign prince, person, prelate, state, potentate, etc., etc., it's good, it sounds great. That was in there to entrap us and to draw us in. It sounds like it's expressing the same principles as the Magna Carta, and in that respect it is. But the problem is... By being drawn in by that sort of meritorious paragraph, one is accepting and embracing the whole act, without realising that elsewhere the declaration text contained one of the most devastating weapons to the original constitutional safety mechanism. So what is that safety mechanism that you know now? Trial by jury and annulment by jury. Why? Because what happened at the time is they started putting qualifications on who could serve as in, in the jury. And in fact, what happened is over half the population of the country were, um, were denied access to be part of juries. And you, you, so they're, they're stacking the jury now at this point. In fact, it actually happened earlier than that. Um, they started whittling away 70 years after the Magna Carta. It all started happening. So constitutional statutes is a contradiction, actually. If one points to the Bill of Rights as an authority... One is elevating a government-created statute beyond its natural jurisdiction, which hands enormous power to Parliament. And this is where the Parliament is sovereign mantra comes from. Conniving and devious power grabbers of the late 17th century instigated this very deliberately to allow their own law to be regarded as constitutional. So this is how they were able to get away with it, with taking us into, into Europe, for example, in the first place. Because everybody was pointing at the Bill of Rights, the act that was written by them, by those that would wish to overrule, uh, sorry, to, yes, to overrule the rule of law and give Parliament greater powers than they should have. They, they could ignore or alter this as they see fit, because it's one of theirs. They know it's not constitutional, but everyone else thinks it is. So, let's just go into democracy and what it, what it is and what it isn't. Democracy, what it is not, it is not suffrage. Suffrage is totalitarian, communist, leads to fascist states. Suffrage is the voting in elections. That's, that's not what democracy is. Everybody thinks it is, but it isn't. Is it, it's, it's not referenda, either way, or mass voting, either. It's not legislatorial voting by representatives. Um, and it isn't... It, well, what it does, this does, is creates consensus politics. Suffrage creates consensus politics. That's not democracy. So let's go and look at the lex lexicography. That's a big word, isn't that? Lexicography breaks down, down into etymology, philology, various different subjects to do with the, the language behind words. So if we break down the word democracy, let's have a look at that. So it comes from demos, the Greek word demos, the people. And then kratos, sovereignty. Or kratein, to rule, that's the verb. People rule. It's derived from the Hellenic Athenian constitution. And of course most of us think that this is all about um, voting. Of course that, that, they've raised that in our, in our minds as being the key attribute of what went on in Athens. Well, it didn't, actually. It's, it's, it did as well, but there was something more important earlier on, particularly in early, early Athens. It was about government by trial by jury. Government by trial by jury. You govern by it. OK, and sovereignty of the individual citizen juror as the final arbiter of law. That's what democracy is. It's not voting in, poll in, in elections... It's giving citizens the power to annul government law in trials. 
So specifically, Exalsia writes, this was at the time of Cleisthenes, 508 to 507 BC. What were Exalsia writes? It was the right to attend, yeah, to debate, yes, to vote, yes, as well. But this is the key, trial by jury for the accused and empowering citizens with judicial authority as jurors. You're getting the gist of it. I'm repeating it, but it's so important. Now, whilst that was the case, um, it should be pointed out that it was infant in form in those days. There, was no, there were no equal rights for women, um, and slavery remained, of course. But given time, if certain things hadn't happened, um, it wouldn't have been long, and we would have hit a very, very different point in the development of humanity if that had been allowed to, to continue in the way that it was at the time. So, James Wilson, Justice James Wilson, again, the ultimate power. The empowerment of citizens by bestowing on them judicial authority as jurors in trial by jury, in which laws and measures passed by legislatorial majorities in the Assembly could be judged, overruled and annulled whenever this was deemed by the jurors necessary to serve justice, liberty and the interests of the people. Now, how far have I gone on? How am I doing for time? Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Because what I was going to do at this point was just to paint a little bit of a background. I'll probably only be at about another eight, nine minutes, something like that. But it's quite important to understand the conspiratorial nature of our reality. So I've got up here, you won't, you won't see it, I've given up on that. It's really um, there's a, there's a, there's a, oh, is it? Yeah. I've got rather a lot of slides to get through there. Um, I'll just keep clicking and see if I can catch up. Um, what I've got on, on the screen here, about to come up, if you can see it, is a pie chart. Uh, and the segments of the pie chart have all sorts of subjects on them, um, showing up various, um, uh, various areas of human endeavour, if you like, in society that are, f are affected by uh, conspiracy. And I'm using that word unashamedly, not putting theory on the end. There's nothing theoretical about most of this now. I think you realise that there's an awful lot of information coming out. So I've got um, law and the court system. I've got 5G, AI, EMF technology. So uh, Mark's going to talk about that. Um, media and information manipulation. Uh, banking and finance. I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, fracking, geoengineering, GMOs. We've got the pharmaceutical industry and what's going on there. Um, we've got child abuse um, and child trafficking. We've got geopolitics and wars. Now, I'm going to take um, one or two of those, of the, the most important of those areas, and I'm just going to paint the picture. I'm going to give you, give you a whistle-stop um, whistle tour um, of conspiracy, as it is now, in about six, seven minutes. So I'm talk my next slide that, um, is our government abroad. And I've got one or two pictures here. So we've got a picture of, of, of the overthrow of, of Saddam Hussein in, in, in Iraq, um, and uh, placing our favoured regime. Um, we've got a number of sort of chessboard images there, uh, geopolitical images. We've got a, a picture of General Wesley Clark, who actually came straight out with this, with a list of countries that um, the Anglo-American establishment wanted to kind of deal with. I don't know whether you've seen that clip, but it's just quite astonishing. Um, and then on, on the bottom right, we've got... Um, the last one is Iran. The last one is... A, a, the one on the bottom right, if you can see it, is Libya. Um, that was um, a change of uh, regime, of course. Um, won't go into it because I haven't got time. Now I'm going to go into the hidden influence, what's going on behind the scenes, because clearly what's normally on the surface, the mechanisms um, that are exposed to us, that we can see, the machinery of government, uh, is one thing. We can see it doesn't work, but... Um, there's plenty that goes on behind the scenes. And a lot of this was exposed by a number of key people. Now, one of those I'm going to just name. If, you, if you've got a pen, take some of these things down, because they're important. So, Professor Carol Quigley. I'm not sure whether you're aware of, of, of him. He was uh, Bill Clinton's mentor, in fact. But he wrote two key books. He was an insider historian. So, the history that he documented was not just the history that we learn about in schools and universities... This was the history of what was really going on behind the scenes. And um, one of those books was Tragedy and Hope. It's a massive book, that thick. It's just good luck. I haven't read it yet, but I have read the second book, The Anglo-American Establishment. 
which is also quite dry, but there are one or two jaw-dropping moments in it. And it does list the dark actors behind the scenes, people like Colonel Edward Mandel House uh, and others. But what it outlines is the structure of the secret societies and the think tanks that were established at the turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and one of those was one of the key um, players in that was, was Cecil Rhodes, uh, who established the Rhodes Society. Didn't have a name, they didn't name it deliberately. Uh, then it became known as the Society of the Elect. And it was based on the original Adam Weishaupt um, Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati that was um, founded in 1776, it, on concentric circles, so compartmentalism. So you have the inside group, but then each layer didn't know of the existence of the inside one. So round the outside of the, the, the inside group, the Society of the Elect, you had the Milner group. Lord Alfred Milner was very instrumental. Um, they brought Fleet Street, and they bought up Fleet Street in the Times of London. They'd taken over by 1920, certainly. Um, and then we had the Round Table groups, which were a group outside um, the Society of the Elect, or the, the Milner group, in each of the former British colonies. Um, and then outside those, you had the front groups. And in America, that was the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations. And in this country, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, known more colloquially as Chatham House, who are the real string pullers behind the scenes, largely, along with the intelligence agencies. Now, another key figure, important figure um, in all of this, um, sorry, an important um, author, I should say, in all of this, was Anthony Sutton. Um, yeah. um, Anthony Sutton wrote an important book called Wall Street um, and the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and if you read that book, you can see who the real string pullers were uh, behind the, 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 the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, key bankers, um, Olaf Ashberg, um, William Boyce Thompson, some of these key players that were facilitating and funding, um, even before you get to Trotsky and Lenin and, and, uh, and others that came after. My next slide after that is exposing the mainstream media, because they're lying to us on a massive scale. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you, if you want to prove that to yourself, one of the best ways of doing that is to go, and, go onto YouTube and go and have a look at the media on trial events. Maybe one or two of you were there. Now, Media on Trial is an organisation that, that started um, putting on events called Media on Trial. I think they've had three now. The last one, they were actually, um, the, the venue where they were going to have it was lent on by the establishment, um, and they had it cancelled on them. But they were then offered another venue by a mosque. Interestingly. Great guys. Fantastic. But there were some key speakers at this. Some really important people that you should tap into if, you, if you're not already. So Professor Piers Robinson from Leeds University talks very eloquently about propaganda and manipulation techniques. And by the way, um, one of the key think tanks that, that started the whole business of information manipulation and... Um, manipulating how, how peop uh, people's perceptions uh, was the Tavistock Institute, which came out of the Cecil Rhodes Secret Society network. Um, and it then went on over into America with projects like MKUltra. Um, but Professor Piers Robinson really breaks that down very, very well. So have a look on, on there. We've got in independent journalists like Patrick Hanningson, uh, who has its own, his own um, uh, 21st Century Wire. It appears on RT quite a lot. Vanessa Beely has been outlining uh, what's really going on in Syria with the, the regime change operation, operations over there that have been going on um, and how go our government sends change agents into a society to change public perception um, within that society. Um, as on provo provocateurs, um, all, all of that, divide and rule, buying people, important media people, you know, you know the story. Um, now, in, that, in those events, we also had Peter Ford, who is a, a Brit former British ambassador to Syria, um, who's a bit of a thorn in the side of the establishment because he's been giving a completely different narrative as to what's been going on in Syria, uh, absolutely in alignment with Vanessa and, and others. Um, and, you know, you know, and that last event was, was kiboshed by the establishment, but 
you had a you had a former ambassador speaking at it. I mean, what is going on? You know. <clears throat> um, there's another figure in the middle I put who wasn't on the media and trial events, but she's brilliant. Um, Eva, Eva Bartlett, as well, from Canada, who's also another independent journalist who's been exposing what's really going on um, in places like Palestine, Syria. Um, and the picture there is actually her talking at, at an event in the, at, at the United Nations. She'd just come back. Very, very awkward for the, for the United Nations, um, with a whole load of charity workers explaining what, what was really seen. Um, then I'm just going to talk briefly about private central banks, because this is the other critical subject. The first subject that, that us at the New Chartist Movement are talking about, the first subject is what we've just been talking about, the British Constitution, the trial by jury system, and common law. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is exposing what is happening with private central banks and our money system. Now, one of the, the best books on that is by a gentleman called G. Edward Griffin, um, but, uh, called The Creature from Jekyll Island, and it's all about the Federal Reserve of America um, and its foundation in 1913. And all of the private central banks, what well, most people think of as central banks, all fall under um, one single ba pr central bank called the Bank for International Settlements in Basel in Switzerland. And that's exposed by my great colleague and friend, Justin Walker, at the British Constitution Group, uh, who talks a lot about the Bradbury Pound. Um, and this is all part of it, because if you can expose the information about the fact that our government is supposed to be creating our money under common law by the Treasury, interest-free, that's how they're supposed to be generating our money. Instead, they actually give the privilege to their chums in private central banks, and then we get charged massive interest on it. The whole system is just totally rigged. <clears throat> and then bottom left, we have Ronald Bernard, who uh, is an interesting whistleblower. By the way, these, these three, Justin, Ronald, and then the next one, Anthony Stansfeld, were all um, uh, produced whistleblower testimony um, at the IT, um, ITNJ, the International Tribunal into Natural Justice. Um, extraordinary uh, testimony about all sorts of subjects, but Ronald Bernard was a top-level banker uh, and came out and explained how the system actually works, or doesn't, um, for the people at least, anyway. Um, and he also exposed some fairly horrifying stuff about uh, child trafficking as well and some very, very dark information. And then Anthony Stansfeld, who's the police and crime commissioner for the Thames Valley Police, is involved at the moment exposing the most unbelievable potential scandal um, about top-level banks in this country potentially colluding with the FSA, the Financial Standards Authority. And this is going to blow fairly soon, I suspect. Uh, and then the last thing that I just want to touch on, because this is a deep rabbit hole... Everything has a reflection, is the title of this slide. Uh, so what, what is this about? Now, the, my wake up to this was this, this gentleman called Scott Bartle. Uh, and he put a fantastic video together. It's on YouTube, look out for it. It's called What the F-U-Q. It's not being rude, don't worry. It means uh, frequently unanswered questions of the Australian government. Um, and what this was about, he was trying to import a classic car. He has a, a bit of an interest in classic cars. And he was in the... Um, he's a very talented individual in business. Um, very astute. And he was importing this classic car. And he was starting to get all, the whole runaround about tax for, for, for the um, air conditioning unit and all kinds of things. Um, and he started asking questions. Not about, why am I being charged and all that sort of... But asking, who are you? Who are you? Because he started noticing some slightly strange things. Anyway, the, the upshot was that the, the offices of government that were writing to him about this, requiring his extra money and all the rest of it, were coming from the Australian government. And then he discovered that there, there are two governments of Australia. There's the government of Australia that form, falls under the Commonwealth. And then there was another government of Australia the Australian government, that was registered as a corporation in New York. 
um, under Uniform Commercial Code, UCC, which was, um, by the way, all our legislation now, all statutory law, is, is, we think, is now under UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, um, and it functions in commerce um, now through um, tacit uh, contracts, which I'm not going to go into. It's too complicated for this talk. But anyway, the point, the, the point is, is that they've created, essentially, a mirror version of everything. Okay, and this includes the United Kingdom, and there's a corporate version of it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's your local police force, there's a corporate version of it. Uh, even your LEA, I suspect, has the real thing, and then there's a corporate version of it. And they're all registered under the, um, you know, you can go and look on Companies House or um, Dun & Bradstreet. And I've got three examples, actually. Uh, the United Kingdom Corporation Limited is registered at 6 Sharon Court, London, N1218X, and it has a Dun & Bradstreet number. Theresa May, MP, Maidenhead. Devon and Cornwall Police is registered as a corporation. So that raises all sorts of questions, doesn't it, really, about the existence of the Constitution and common law, just bringing it back full circle again, yeah? How can they operate like this? Because if it is a corporation or a company then it's going to have shareholders, it's going to have a CEO, there's profit being made. Um, the last thing, actually, I was going to say, because he's not here today, and I thought he was going to be here, David Ellis. And I got a picture of him. I'm glad he's not here, because he'd be embarrassed. Um, about the European Union, that's a big subject for you guys. And about PESCO and the, the Permanent Structures Corporation, military integration. So I was going to mention that as well. And then I've got a slide showing recommendations for if you want to get into this information on an everyday basis. I recommend two places. The UK column, if you haven't already gone to, gone to that as a, as a source, I call, it, I call it the Radio 4 of the alternative media. Now, I don't know if Brian thinks that that's a compliment or not. I don't know. <laughs> um, but their analysis and their slicing and dicing of the information is second to none. And I really urge you on a regular basis to listen to the UK column. And the other one is 21st Century Wire, Patrick Henningsen. He does a programme on Sunday called Sunday Wire. Download it, listen to it, if you really want to know what's going on. So, and that's it. And we get to my final slide, um, apart from the, um, my logo, the New Chartist Movement. Um, common law trial by jury um, and sovereign national credit and the Bradbury Pound is placed into a circle cut in half because those two subjects are the ones that if you, if you really want to stir things up with the establishment you've got to talk about those two subjects and take action on them because you'll the reason why it should be easier is because they should be in place already. They're meant to be there already. It's written into the Constitution. So common law trial by jury with annulment and sovereign national credit, Bradbury Pound. And I think you'll find that those two things are the solution to our problems. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for listening so far.